Dad, thank you for everything. You're my hero, my ultimate supporter, and my pal. You have always been there for me, and I came and expressed the number of times I have thought about how lucky I am to have you in my life. You're the greatest role model a son could ever wish for, and I am eternally grateful for our relationship. There are a few phrases or questions that my dad has always asked me, and one of these is, what do you do when the fort falls down? When I was younger, my dad and I would build these forts in the backyard, and sometimes they would get destroyed by storms. Every time this happened, he would repeat this phrase to me, what do you do when the fort falls down? And then he would say, you build it back. Since I was only five and just having my awesome boys only hideout destroyed, I wasn't always too happy when he would ask me this. It took me years to realize the true meaning of his commentary, though now I understand and appreciate his perspective. My dad still asks me this question sometimes when something that goes wrong, and though I often give him the quiet response of, you build it back, I am thankful for his teaching me how important my attitude is when unfavorable situations and things are thrown my way. My dad and I have had countless great memories together, and some of them occurred when just the two of us would drive to Michigan in the summers. During one of these road trips, when I was probably only four, we just talked the whole way up there, never turning on the radio. A few years later, during the road trip, we listened to Justin Bieber the whole time at my dad's request, and together we sang Baby and One Less Lonely Girl on repeat for 11 hours. Another time that we were driving, the only thing we passed on the road for miles were military vehicles. We had all the windows down and our arms out of them while we were screaming. My dad got pulled over going close to 90 miles an hour. My dad's support for my siblings and our interests has been really meaningful to me. My dad becomes an extremely passionate spectator when one of his children is participating in any sporting event, no matter the age or the sport. And this year during our football season, it was amplified. We developed various rituals. One of these was that he would send me what he referred to as his kill text every Friday afternoon before our games. Each text was unique, but they followed this pattern, a picture relating to our opponent and the word kill in all capital letters. For example, when we played JP2, it was a picture of the Pope with red X's over his eyes, a few sentences which I can't repeat, and then kill in all capital letters. As I look back on the past, this football season was a time in which we developed a stronger bond. He was there with me through the highs and lows, which began this summer when he picked me up from belt buckle. As we were driving home, he asked me how it went, and I was sort of quiet in my responses. He could tell something was up. I then told him where I wasn't, I wasn't where I had wanted or had hoped to be in terms of the lineup. He pulled the car over and told me a few things that I will never forget. He told me that this doesn't define you. He also told me that it is okay for this concern to hurt. In fact, it should affect you because it means you care. But how do you use this pain? How do you turn disappointed feelings into something you can use to your benefit? My dad changed my mindset on this situation and he was with me the whole way through the season. His helping me through this journey made the post win hugs even that much more meaningful. My dad and I are very similar. One way in which this is true is that we sometimes know what the other is about to say and can read how each other are feeling. This connection really comes in handy when my mom is giving me what I refer to as one of her speeches, and my dad knows I'm about to argue with her, and he gives me a look and slightly nods his head, signaling to me it is not the right time to have a debate with your mother. Dad, I don't know if you know this, but some of my friends refer to you as Big Jeff or just Jeffrey, and one or two of my friends who have seen you after you've gotten out of some body of water have referred to you as Sasquatch. The reason for this nickname is that my dad's side of the family has the unfortunate back hair trait. I like to joke with him about this button characteristic, and when I do, he makes sure I know I will also enjoy this trait one day. Some of my favorite times with my dad are our enjoying nature together, especially spending time at the farm where my dad grew up, playing outside, my dad Rush and I tripling on turkeys, hunting in blind six, and sneaking around the Smurf woods. These experiences have been really meaningful to me, and they are things we both love and get to do together. Dad, I'll never forget our week home alone when we watched Yellowstone, our deceptive five mile hike which took us straight up a mountain, or the time your car got sandwiched in between two fallen trees while tornadoes and straight line winds were soaring all around us and you managed to get us out of there. Your presence always lifts me up and the love that you show our family means the world to me. I don't know what I'm gonna do next year when I can't just wander into your room, lie in the bed and talk with you and mom. I'm going to miss you a lot next year. I love you, Dad.
Hi there. My name is Joseph Ditello, um, and uh, it wasn't until recently that I figured out I sat in the wrong seat this, e <coughs> this evening. It's supposed to be right up here in the front, so that's my bad. <laughs> so um, today I would like to speak a little bit about my father, Jeffrey Ditello. Um, I don't know, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure if he knew I was speaking today, so surprise. Um, uh, growing up with a dad like m mine for 18 years, I've realized that because of his influence, my upbringing differs in many ways from a stereotypical southern household. And I'm going to explain by starting with a little history lesson. My dad was born in St. Petersburg, Florida to a single mother and grew up with two brothers. As the youngest child by, uh, by 10 years, uh, my dad was raised along a typical teenager brother and a fully grown marine. Uh, his youth is full of stories to tell at both dinner tables and parties, his favorites of which being the time his brother forced him to eat french fries until he threw up um, because he annoyed him while his girlfriend was over, um, and the time he had to search a garage for his neighbor's toe uh, after the poor man had accidentally sliced it off with a lawnmower. Um, now you may be thinking, that, that's probably a lie, right? Well. Uh, I can assure you this guy's still alive, and um, I had the pleasure of listening to my dad talk with him over the gruesome loss of his toe as if they were just friendly neighbors passing each other on the street. Um, from his seemingly chaotic childhood, my dad decided to pursue a much more peaceful career, vascular surgery. Um, <laughs> It was during his very brief education, consisting of nursing school and nursing occupation to pay for his pre-med studies, medical school, seven-year residency, fellowship, and overseas training in England, where he met my mother, moved to Nashville, and started working at Vanderbilt. You're probably still wondering how my dad contributed to my non-Southern upbringing. Well, I'll start with the most obvious. Our household is not a yes sir, yes ma'am household. And I did not realize this was unusual until, until I started having friends at MBA. Um, and no, this does not mean I have any less respect for my parents. It's just it's the way it is in my household. Um, I personally believe it's because my father was educated um, in the North, and he was never addressed as sir until he started his um, general surgery, surgery residency program. Sorry. Um, he constantly reminds an MBA alum, T. Griscom, to stop calling him sir at work, but alas, the MBA habits stick with us. Um, additionally, the sanctions on explicit language have also relaxed in our home because both my mother and father are not particularly quiet or polite when they are upset on the phone. Um, living with a doctor in the house is like having two different weather forecasts. The first is, you know, normal weather, your precipitation, snow, rain, etc. The second is what dad's mood's going to be like when he gets home. And, um, and you know he's upset when he'll, you know, he'll cook and he'll take out his skillets and pans and it'll be a little bit louder in the kitchen than normal. Or he'll, um, he won't have the patience to put on gloves and he'll touch a hot pan or, or, um, or something in the oven. Um, yeah. Um, regardless, several... Um, Sorry. Yeah, regardless, several expletives later, we'll sit down as a family to talk about whether the, uh, whatever situation particularly bothered him that day, and eventually we'll set in, settle into the famous Dottillo dinner. Um, my family dinner is sacred in our households. Uh, my dad loves to plan, connect, and discuss events, politics, life lessons, sports, and pretty much anything else my brother and I want to talk about. His dedication to these dinners is exemplified not only by his efforts in making superb meals, but also by the motto engraved on four of our glasses that says, Dottillo la familia e tutto, which literally translates to Dottillo, family means everything. I've learned a lot at that table, and if it wasn't for my father's ability to tell a funny story or make a relatively uninteresting event captivating or to promote dedication to planning and work ethic, I wouldn't have become the gentleman scholar, musician coder, and oarsman that I am today. I wouldn't have inherited the exact same sarcastic humor or the unrelenting drive to accomplish what I set my mind to. Dad, I'm nearing what you like to call my run at MBA, and I'm starting to ask myself how in the world you survived another 17 years of education. 
You've accomplished so much, both personally and professionally, but hardest of all, you did all of that while making time to make family mean everything to you. You watched me pick dandelions in the outfield at baseball games and dance in the ensemble at the Harding Play. You took me to Southeasterns when I swam for Nashville Aquatic Club, and you were there to watch the lightweight eight medal at Hooch. You sat at my bar mitzvah and listened to me chant in a language you didn't understand. You celebrate Christmas with us every year despite the whole Jewish thing. Um, You supported my interest in code even when I got a little bit obsessive about it. And finally, you watched as I closed the curtain on my final Chalafani show. You do this much and more for mom, Michael, and me. You are my advocate and support me in everything that I do. Dad, I want to end with this one phrase that that you've always said to me and I will never forget. But it encapsulates all the love and thanks that I have in me for what you do for our family. You are my sunshine too, Dad. Thank you. Love you, Dad. Thank you, Gates and Joseph. Uh, so while I make these few comments, uh, Ben Burns, if you please come on up. Ben is the president of the Fathers Club, has done a terrific job, and he and some other fathers will now make some comments. But prior to that, I just want to thank with you Martin's Barbecue, particularly Courtney Clark, who's here tonight. So join me in telling their staff how much we appreciate this thing. Uh, I would like to start by thanking all of you fathers for making sacrifices to be here tonight for your sons. At first, I wasn't sure if my dad would be able to, to, to attend this event. I knew that Congress would be in session and that my dad would have to miss several votes to fly back to Nashville just to be here. But when I called my dad to ask if he were going to be able to make it, I knew his answer would be yes before the words left my mouth. Now, the last time my dad missed a vote while Congress was in session was the time he flew down to Chattanooga for our state championship game back in December. The next day, he was blasted all over the media, and he even made the front page of the Chattanooga Times Free Press. So, Dad, I'm interested to see what the fake news will cook up about your being here tonight. Dad, I appreciate the tremendous sacrifices that you're making to be sitting here today, and your being here really means a lot to me and my brother Stephen. Now, ever since I can remember, I've always wanted to be an Eagle Scout like my dad. One of the final requirements to achieve the rank of Eagle is to write a, quote, statement of your ambitions and life purpose. Now, for a 14-year-old boy, this was a pretty daunting task. And so, as any boy charged with a daunting task would do, I went straight to my dad to ask him for help. In response, dad spent hours rummaging through his old scouting gear until he finally found his own life purpose statement that he wrote when he was my age. Here's 14-year-old Bill Haggerty's life purpose statement. My life purpose. After I complete high school, I would like to enter college. I would like to get a scholarship to college if possible. I would like to attend law school. After I complete college, I would like to enter the Navy or the Coast Guard. After I get out of the service, I would like to practice law in a large city. If I do well in law, I would like to enter politics. I would enjoy being an ambassador to a foreign country. I believe that if I could get high enough in the political field, I could aid in the betterment of our country. Now, if you ignore the misspell words like ambassador or for Rhine or be live, as well as the complete butchering of commas, this message is extraordinarily powerful. I mean, talk about achieving your dreams. Besides entering the Navy, I wish my dad was denied at age 17 because he found out he was colorblind during the Navy's physical testing. My dad had completed each and everything in his life purpose statement. After high school, he attended Vanderbilt undergrad and then Vanderbilt Law as a Patrick Wilson scholar. During law school, he worked at a large law firm in New York City. After a career in the private sector, my dad entered politics as the 30th ambassador to Japan. And finally, my dad moved higher in the political field to aid in the betterment of our country as our United States Senator. After reading my dad's life purpose statement, I knew that in writing out my own, 
I would legitimately be mapping out my own life's purpose. Now this was a lot of pressure for 14 year old me. I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do yet with my life. But this got me thinking, what do I really cherish? What makes me happy? In life, what do I look forward to most? Who do I want to be remembered as? And as I, as I started answering those questions, my life's purpose began to come into focus. What do I really cherish? Well, my most cherished memory was going on a week-long cross-country canoeing expedition through Canada with my dad and my brother Stephen. What makes me happy? Well, uh, I absolutely love going to Brown's Diner at exactly 11.15 every single Saturday with my dad. In life, what do I look forward to the most? Every single day, I wake up looking forward to my dad coming home on Thursday nights so I can see him for the weekend. Who do I want to be remembered as? Now this one was really tough, but as I kept thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking, I couldn't stop thinking about my dad. And that's when I started to realize that my favorite part about life was doing it with my dad. And at that moment, my life's purpose became clear. I realized that if I could provide my own kids with the same complete devotion and pure love that my father holds for me and my siblings, then I would be fulfilled in life. Now I eventually submitted my life's purpose statement and I eventually obtained the rank of Eagle. And now, as I'm finishing my last few months of high school and again thinking about my future and what I want to do with my life, I constantly find myself thinking about my dad. Now if I could give one piece of advice to the underclassmen here tonight, I would say this. Cherish the moments and memories you have with your dad now because at the end of the day, those memories will be the ones that you cherish the most. I'm really gonna miss you next year, Dad. And as I reflect on how you've accomplished your own life's purpose, I hope to become equally successful in accomplishing my own, becoming a father just like you. Thank you. Following tradition, I did not tell my dad that I would be speaking here tonight. Uh, this is my dad and I's final father-son dinner together. And as I've reflected back on my life, I'm so thankful to have a great role model who has sacrificed so much for me over the years. My dad can be a little bit of an organization freak. Uh, every Sunday when I was a kid, we would spend two to three hours taking everything out of the garage, giving a nice clean, and then putting it back in the exact same place. Uh, with four kids and two dogs, it's virtually impossible to keep the house exactly how he wants it. Being organized is just one of his dorky traits. Uh, in high school, my dad and his friends created a toilet paper club where they would go around and roll people's houses. I'm not exactly sure how y'all's dads spent their time in high school, but I know that rolling people's houses might not have been the coolest thing to do on Friday nights. Uh, so if anyone ever tries to roll our house, beware of retaliation. Uh, my dad and I have always been intentional about spending time together. In retrospect, I can see how I've benefited and grown much closer to him. He and I are a lot alike and sometimes has led to us bumping heads. Uh, growing up, I played on some golf tours. And for some of the tournaments, my dad, being the experienced golfer he is, would be my caddy. Back then, I used to have somewhat of a temper, and whenever my dad would coach me up before a shot, I would often proceed to do the exact opposite of whatever he told me to do. One tournament at Ted Rhodes, I shanked my drive with a huge slice behind some trees, and my dad advised me to take my medicine and pitch back to the fairway with a pitching wedge. I then grabbed my three wood, I lined up, smacked the ball, threaded the needle between three tree branches, and rolled it up onto the green. That was probably one of three times that my stubborn method actually worked out. I'm not going to go into the times where he was actually right. After some of the tournaments, I'd get pretty down on myself, but my dad would always lift me up and cover me about how golf is just a game. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard attitude is everything. When I was 12, my dad and I played in a father-son golf tournament in which I was forced to share him as a partner with my little brother. 
My dad and I were the heavy favorites going into the golf tournament, but on hole number five, he ended up shanking two straight shots out of bounds and onto Granny White Pike. This debacle led to a third place finish behind my younger brother, whom my dad incidentally played very well, well for that day. I'm sorry, Dad, but I can't resist giving you a hard time about that day. My dad and I now use golf as a way to have fun and bond together. Every once in a while, I even beat him. If you ask him, it's only been three times, but it's actually been four. Every morning from seventh grade to ninth grade, my dad would drive me to school. It'd be relatively quiet for most of the ride, except for the radio. We listened to sports talk radio like 104.5 or 102.5 every single morning. But as we were pulling up to school, he'd ask me how many tests or quizzes I had. But then right as I was getting out of the car, he'd always say to me, ring the bell. Sometimes when we wanted to add, add some extra flair, he would say, ring the Montgomery bell. Occasionally, someone would overhear it and give me a glare like, who is that crazy guy dropping you off? But looking back on those moments, I realized the purpose of his embarrassing catchphrase. He was trying to remind me of the blessings I have and to take advantage of them. Sometimes, I reflect on those morning drives, and it makes me realize how fast time moves. All I could think about back then was getting my own car and driving myself to school, but now I miss those rides and that time I had with my dad. Every speech you'll ever hear at NBA preaches the same cliche about taking advantage of the time you have, but it really is true. My advice to the underclassmen and their freshmen and their fathers, don't take the quality time for granted. Make time to do stuff or just spend some casual time together. A couple times a month, my dad and I grab breakfast on Friday mornings with a couple other dads and their sons. Little acts of brotherhood like that are what lead to great relationships between a father and son. As far as my dad and I have come, I'm not sure how I'm going to do life without him by my side every day. He has worked very hard in all he does to give my siblings and me opportunities that he did not have growing up. Dad, thank you for always being there for me. Thank you for all you've given me. And as I go on in life, I'll always remember our moments growing up and I'll always strive to ring the bell. Thank you, Dad. It is an honor tonight to speak about my father, Kent Maxwell, who I'm pretty sure had no idea I was going to speak tonight, given he asked me whether or not we needed to attend. Um, my dad has worn many hats, financial planner, entrepreneurial consultant, Boy Scout leader, board member of my preschool, coach of numerous sports he never played, treehouse aficionado, expert of all things prehistorical, and for those of you who don't know, Chewbacca impersonator. So if, you've ever, if anybody here has ever seen a grown man driving around Nashville in a full body Chewbacca outfit around Halloween, that was probably my dad. My favorite role that my dad plays is that of a lifelong learner. Whether it be the geology of Tennessee in the Cretaceous period, the evolution of humankind, or the early history of indigenous communities in the United States, my dad has a voracious appetite for knowledge, especially topics concerning prehistory. Through these interests, my dad has encouraged and developed my curiosity and the curiosity of my younger brothers. From a young age, my dad was never unwilling to explain some complex concept or entertain our frustrating questions. My dad was patient, he was kind, and he was so invested in our education that he eagerly explained these concepts to us. For example, one morning as we drove to school during my first grade year, NPR was on and it was covering the Jasmine Revolt in Tunisia. The story seemed quite interesting to my seven-year-old self, so I began asking some basic questions about the revolution. Who was rebelling? Whom were they rebelling against? Where is Tunisia? Who is Jasmine? Etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Naturally, my dad tolerantly explained to me that there was an oppressive dictator in Tunisia who was facing a revolution by his own people, seeking democracy and freedom, and that this revolt in Tunisia was inspiring similar movements in other Arab countries. I proceeded to ask him more questions in an attempt to understand the complicated story as my dad continued to answer them for me. When he dropped me off for school, I immediately found one of my fellow first graders 
and explained to him exactly what my dad had told me, that there was an oppressive dictator in Tunisia who was facing a rebellion by his own people, seeking democracy and freedom, and that this revolt was inspiring other movements in uh, Arab countries. By the time I was toward the end of my explanation, we were walking into our first grade classroom. My teacher, Mrs. Reed, overheard our conversation and was surprised to hear two first graders talking about geopolitical issues in the Middle East. She pulled me aside and asked me what I was talking about. I proceeded to confidently explain to her about the oppressive dictator in Tunisia and the people protesting for democracy. My interest in and knowledge of this matter seemed to confuse her, but had she known my dad, she would have understood. When I was younger, my dad picked us up from preschool one afternoon, and on our way back, he pulled over on the side of the road to collect huge rocks that had recently fallen. To everyone else that had passed him, they were insignificant and hardly noticeable. But to my dad, they were evidence of a long lost time when the ground beneath our feet was an ocean, occupied by simple aquatic creatures whose traces can be seen today. My dad took the rocks home, sprayed and brushed the dirt off, and began identifying the various fossilized tracks that were left in the rocks. He would point to each one, explain to my brothers and me, who were still in preschool, what animal they were a remnant of, and how long ago they were likely carved. The conscious investment my dad made in developing our curiosity from an early age has had a profound impact on my brothers and me. Similar to our father, and largely because of our father, we have found our own niche topics of interest whether that be mechanical engineering, elections, or political law, each Maxwell has his own area of expertise, thanks to our dad. If there is one thing I would like to impart on my fellow students tonight, it would be to respect and cherish your dad's quirks, his weird interests, and his peculiar habits, because often they will form an integral part of who you are and who you will become. I often joke when people ask me about my younger brother Raleigh that he stands on the shoulders of giants obviously referring to me. But the truth is that we both stand on the shoulders of a much greater giant, my dad. With that, I would like to conclude by saying, Dad, I love you, and I am so grateful for all that you have done for me and taught me. Thank you.